Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a returning guest from a while ago, Joe Bakhti. He's the founder of a company called Quant Gene, and uh, we had a really great talk last time. We talked about cancer and tumors and how the cells are not just one cell with uh, one set of genes. They're very heterogeneous and how this can help improve cancer treatments. And I wanted him back because, as I told him offline, I figured he's very hard at work innovating and uh, figuring out new things in the world of cancer and with other diseases. So I want to welcome you back, Joe. Thank you for coming. Hi, Richard. Uh, It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah. Well, for listeners that may not know, first, tell me about QuantGene. What's the premise of the company? Yeah, QuantGene was founded in 2015 at UC Berkeley. um, And we started in the cancer detection space using cell-free DNA. We just uh, saw a tremendous opportunity opening up um, based on some new technology platforms that evolved very rapidly back then and even today. Uh, Sequencing, but also artificial intelligence, pattern recognition algorithms. um, And so that... We basically had an insight um, that other others you know didn't have back then. How you can potentially look at cell-free DNA that is shed by cancer cells into the bloodstream um, and understand the mutational patterns on these fragments um, to the extent necessary to do early detection. So we saw this amazing opportunity to detect the 15 deadliest cancers at early stages with a simple blood draw. Um, oh wow! if we design some, you know, new form of sequencing um, that is much, much more precise, thousands of times more accurate than conventional sequencing. And that involved a lot of computing, artificial intelligence, but also chemistry innovation. So that's, that's the history of QuantGene. And then from okay. there, we basically went into, you know, figuring these things out, which is a deep biotechnology effort, um, and then went more and more into commercial questions. How do you even sell this? who wants it, how does insurance pay for it or not, um, and how do you bring this amazing technology once you have it to actual patients? And that turned out to be another giant thing we had to figure out. Um, that is a business model question, and we went from there to actually launch uh, uh, one of the first really comprehensive kind of medical intelligence solutions for patients that includes doctors, but it's something we sell directly to patients uh, in a subscription model. So that's, I think, a lot of innovation there on the on the business model side too. Well, that's unusual. So you're selling direct to patients, what, like a kit where they can sample themselves and uh, look to see if they they have the beginnings of a number of cancers? It's a more complex, it's a whole, um, it's kind of a whole preventative primary care solution that includes physicians um, and genetic counselors. Uh, you also get a kit, um, but Results like that, you can't just report back to patients. That would be not, you know, that would be violation of um, practice of medicine rules. Um, So we designed a system where you become a subscriber with a monthly subscription fee um, and get an annual test plus other things you need for cancer detection um, as a whole package or a turnkey solution where you also get trained physicians who understand these things um, to, to kind of watch over you continuously. I want to ask you about the technology a bit. You mentioned cell-free DNA. So I could see one way that's nice to sample is not to have to do a biopsy. And you also probably get a better representation of what's actually in a tumor because you're not just getting the needle site or the aspiration site, you know, with cell-free DNA. Um, Is that why? And and is cell-free DNA packaged in like exosomes or extracellular vesicles or how does it come? So there are multiple reasons why this is so important. So number one, Yes, there is a potential to actually replace tissue biopsies with liquid biopsies, which is much safer for patients, number one, especially with lung cancer and other very invasive biopsies that you could potentially avoid. Um, But second, you're totally right. You get a systemic insight into the cancer. So a biopsy um, obviously takes a little piece of a specific tumor site. 
if you have metastatic cancer or you might not even know that you have it and the oncologist just falsely assumes it's not metastatic, um, you don't get a full picture of the systemic uh, representation of the tumor, which is very bad for your adjuvant and chemotherapies uh, because of tumor heterogeneity. And you know you want to know what your entire cancer system looks like, not one specific piece. But the third, maybe the most important point here is in order to do a biopsy, you need to have a detected and local, uh, localized cancer. Uh, so this localization where the cancer actually is requires you to already know a lot of things that you simply don't know in most cases. So for early detection, biopsies don't work because you don't know that you have cancer. Therefore, you don't know where to do the biopsy. And you yeah, know, well, in the- what, what happens if someone has a, a tumor somewhere and they do a resection, they take it out, and then they want to evaluate whether the person still has cancer burden? Do they locally biopsy the tissues or do they try to use a liquid biopsy? Well, that is um, that is one of the most important applications for liquid biopsy that right now you can't do much. It's called minimum residual disease or MRD. And if you do a resection, you just assume it's gone. You can't do much, right? You, you do the resection and then you look at the uh, margins of the tumor you took out and make sure there's no tumor at the margins. But it, that's a very crude method. So you basically cut it out and make sure that the margins of whatever you cut out is all tumor free. And then you assume you cut out more than the tumor and therefore you don't have residual disease. But of course, that's not true in the vast majority of cases, actually, if you're honest about it. Why, well, at least in the majority of cases, that's why you have cancer recurrence so often. And a liquid biopsy, again, is the, the only solution that, that offers a solution to that, um, where you basically look into your blood and see if there's anything left. What about the, um, the sensitivity and specificity of the liquid biopsy? Is it... Uh pretty strong on both fronts or it depend on the cancer? It's very, that's a, actually a much, much more complex question than it sounds because sensitivity and specificity are always a function of the greater surrounding kind of statistical setting. So for metastatic cancer patients, very high. For early detection, kind of low because it's very hard to determine your specificity, for example. Um, let me give you an example. So specificity means... If you have 100 healthy patients and you take 100 samples, how many of them do you diagnose or not flag? So how many of them does your test say are actually cancer-free? And if you take 100 patients and one is being found to have something and you think it's not true, then your specificity is 99% because one out of 100 is falsely diagnosed as a false positive. The problem is you don't know if it's a false positive. If you do a study, you, know, you, you never can source cancer-free patients because no one knows if anyone is cancer-free. All you can do is you can source patients that are currently not diagnosed with cancer. And that equates to, you know, cancer-free, but it doesn't, right? So there is a certain number of people in the population who have cancer who are not diagnosed, probably, you know, 05 to 1% at a certain age group. What, you know, what have you noticed as a, um, <clears throat> as a cancer progresses? Does it become more and more heterogeneous? with or without treatment, or especially in, in response to chemo, let's say? Well, I think there is no general answer to that. This research is not completely conclusive because it's complex research you would have to do because to determine cancer heterogeneity is very hard because you have to, how do you do it? Right? You have to take not just a biopsy, you have to look at kind of an infinite number of points in the tumor to, to actually derive the true heterogeneity. Um, so what we know is every cancer is significantly, has a significant level of heterogeneity. Then from an evolutionary cancer perspective, of course, that's the problem with chemo, especially targeted therapies. Uh, you massively boost, uh, let's say, the mutational speed of tumors. So heterogeneity just means if you have a certain mutational profile in your tumor, so you know like there are a bunch of driver mutations in that tumor, you know, you never know if that's true for all the cells in the tumor or to be more precise, you know, it's definitely not true for all of them. And so if you have a therapy that targets a specific target in the tumor, um, what you do is you knock out these tumor cells, which just means you give more space to the tumor cells that, are, that don't have that mutation. So if you have a tumor that has, you know, 98% of cells have a certain KRAS mutation, but 2% have a different alternative mechanism, you do a KRAS-focused therapy, you might knock out most of these cells, 
but that just means you reduce the 98% to 1% and the 2% remain at 2%. And then the new tumor has a, instead of 90, 99 to one has a, you know, one to two ratio. So it's uh, of these mutations. So it's simple well, evolutionary well, effects that you get. Yeah. What's, what's been observed experimentally in the tumor before treatment and after treatment with chemo, like if you were to assign percentages to the degree of heterogeneity, um, what does that look like before and after, let's say, a chemo treatment? And what's, a, what's effective? Like if I get rid of 99%, let's say a tumor is 99.1, there's just two variations in the cells, and I get rid of the 99 and I have the 1, does that mean I'll just have a longer time until it comes back, but it still will come back? Is there a threshold below which it's very unlikely for a tumor to come back? Uh, no, that's unfortunately much more complex multivariate system. So what you see in many, many cases, I think in the majority of cases you could say is that, you know, after a kind of effective uh, chemotherapy, effective meaning you see a shrinking of the two of the primary tumor um, that you see, you know, when it comes back or starts growing again, that these tumors look different. So they have a different mutational profile in a lot of cases. So it's a very regular problem you're running into. Um, and uh, to your question, how much of a tumor do you have to knock out in order to knock the cancer out? That is unknown because you're dealing with a, or it's indeterminate because you're dealing with a super complex system of balance. I mean, there are some people who have late stage tumors who heal themselves, right? So the question without chemotherapy. So the question is, how does that happen? And the answer is clearly the immune system has figured something out at some point. So the question is, how does the immune system figure something out? And the answer to that is it's extremely complicated because the immune system has infinite ways to kill cancer. And nearly all of them ways, all of these ways are imperfect because cancers are hiding and can block the immune system. So in the end, you're very likely dealing with a highly statistical um, system of balancing things. Uh, immune system figures something out, starts killing tumor cells, tumor cells figure something out, block that part of the immune system again, then nothing happens. At some point, immune system figures it out again on a different pathway and so on. So it's this constant struggle, um, only that it's extremely difficult for the immune system. So if you start giving chemotherapy, um, you're just aiding the immune system in its fight against the tumor by just introducing a completely different weapon that starts killing large numbers of cancer cells independent of the immune system. Of course, you also have the problem that the immune system gets killed to some extent, depending on therapy. So you're always dealing with a um, kind of balancing, you know, balancing system where you have different drivers of cancer destruction um, that are mutually dependent maybe to some extent. Um, and it depends on the individual case uh, how much do you have to destroy in, over to, in order to overcome the tumor? So the immune system always has, has to do the actual cleanup. In the, um, right, yeah. and, and whether it can do that or not, that's not up to the chemotherapy alone or to heterogeneity or anything. I think it's, a, un, it's something we don't understand fully. We just know it's very complex. Well, do you think, okay, so if I assume a tumor is heterogeneous and I give someone chemotherapy, but it only targets part of the tumor, I may mistakenly say it didn't work when in fact it may have worked perfectly, but just on the you know 80% of cells that had that particular mutation that were amenable to that chemotherapy. So is it at the point where you've done any trials or anyone's done trials where they've looked at the heterogeneity of someone's cancer burden and then given them multiple chemo, you know, multiple chemicals that would target nearly all of the mutations if possible and see the effect? Perhaps they can do lower doses, or, you know, a cocktail to be more effective. Yeah, we, are, we didn't explicitly do these studies. We are very focused on early detection and, and recurrence detection. Um, these would be um, kind of adjuvant therapy or companion diagnostics trials. They are very difficult to design and also very costly. Um, and we have like tons and tons and tons of clinical trials that we could do. So we need to be very focused. But um, these trials also, I mean, we have so many things that liquid biopsy opens up this entire blue ocean of opportunity in cancer. And we have to be a little focused because we, there's not unlimited resources, but that is a very important trial that should be done. And we know that certain cocktails of therapies work more effectively, but mostly they are being deployed without understanding heterogeneity. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So how much characterization has been done on the, again, the degree of heterogeneity of, uh, of even a particular type of cancer has that been done? Has that revealed anything? How much research has been done on that? Yeah, has, have there been any studies to specifically look at the degree of heterogeneity in a given cancer type? Um, I'm sure, but um, I don't know uh, off the top of my head um, a specific study that has done that. The challenge is the following. In order, it, you know, it's, it's not that easy to do these studies. In order to do these studies, you need liquid biopsy. Right. If you don't have a liquid biopsy technology, I don't see how you do that. It would be tremendously because you need to have biopsies and then you have to determine the exact tumor fraction uh, that carries a certain mutation. Normally, sequencing technologies can't even do that effectively. Uh, you would need something like we have. And so the challenge is that the whole concept of quantifying heterogeneity in tumors is kind of a new concept. You need very high-tech sequencing technologies like QuantGene or maybe Garden Health, some other liquid biopsy companies. Um, and we are all in the very early stages of even getting our, our focus done, which is early detection, recurrence detection. Um, so there's clearly a huge overhang of opportunity that is not, not you know, captured right now. And um, I think that's that what makes everyone so excited, um, but it's also frustrating for us even because there's a, there are limited resources, right? That always cost you a couple of million of dollars to do something like that. And there are not many companies who can do it. And most of these companies are very busy uh, doing their, you know, whatever new market they have. So it's a pure problem of not enough people. Well, why couldn't um, you partner with, let's say you want to focus on, I don't know, uh, you know pancreatic cancer. Um, <clears throat> why can't you partner with medical organizations that are already going to do a biopsy and have them also do a liquid biopsy, the same patient, same time, and everything. That might be a nice comparison of, <clears throat> you know, what is the, the aspiration biopsy seen with a surgical biopsy versus what you see with the liquid biopsy for a given cancer type. Well, the, it's, it's, it's purely a resource and managerial challenge, right? So we are running one very large trial right now. We have at least 12 trials designed that are in waiting, um, we have people, you know, we have to identify the right partners, raise the funding, organize it, manage it, um, you know, free laboratory resources. So it's, you know, it's not so much a question of getting good ideas for trials. It's more like prioritizing them and putting them in the queue and then walk through them. So it's, you know, you can do early detection trials. You can do focused high-risk early detection trials for high-risk patients in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. You can do uh, minimum residual disease trials after resection of uh, metastatic primary tumors. You can do it for, you know, advanced localized tumors. You do it in gastric cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer. You can do uh, recurrence detection studies uh, that are extremely important uh, for each individual cancer type. You can do tons of different designs of these recurrence studies. And then you can do the studies you were talking about where you have uh, companion diagnostic studies uh, that look at, you know, effects of chemotherapy on, you know, on the tumor representation in the bloodstream. So, you know, in each of these trials uh, has the potential to save thousands of people. So, but it also costs millions of dollars, each of these trials. And so it's all about where do you focus at as a company? Well, right. Okay. So what informs your focus? Is there any data out there? Let's say, I mean, is there any, any generic data? You know, if I have uh, someone that has a primary tumor but no visible metastatic disease, you know, can you say anything that they're less, they have less of a heterogeneous tumor than someone that has metastatic disease? Or if you look at primary versus metastatic sites in general, is there any data you can draw from the guide where to focus and how to focus? Yeah, I mean, we clearly know that uh, later stage cancers, of course, have more a, a vastly more higher variety of mutations you find. We don't know how many of them drive the tumor, how many are kind of byproducts. Um, when we prioritize and design trials, what we do is it's a very complex matrix, but you look at the biggest opportunity. Um, where can you save the most people if it works? And that has mostly to do with early detection. That is really the, the one, and that includes early detection of people who are not diagnosed with cancer, but it also includes people um, who are in uh, remission, so who are out of treatment, but are very afraid that the cancer comes back. 
and detecting these recurrences is very, very, that you do. Um, you know, on a detection level, which is our main focus right now, um, heterogeneity is, is also a very important topic for a very different reason. And that's the problem with, for example, Natera's solution, right? So Natera is another company that went into liquid biopsy a little after us and they are good at certain things. They can, they're very good in doing individual uh, mutation checks like PCR based. And their solution is to take your tumor that they cut out um, and then identify the mutations on these, on the tumor and then pick a very few of them and investigate the presence of these mutations in your blood to, to recognize recurrence. The advantage of that method is that it can be very precise because you're using not sequencing, but PCR, which is a little, much cheaper, but it's also more precise, but it only looks for one specific thing. Um, the problem is when you have a recurrence that looks differently, you know, this can e easily miss it. And so the ability to look at a broad spectrum of key mutations in cancer that is not dependent on your primary tumor that they resected, we believe is a big game changer in recurrence detection because there is tumor heterogeneity and you don't know exactly how the one that comes back actually looks like. So that's how that's me. That's more like a problem. We have. Well, how was heterogeneity first discovered and what are the study or studies that found it or, you know, clinical results. I mean, when you first knew this and figured it out, what, what came to mind? Like, where did you get this info from? Um, I mean, it has been known for quite a while since, like, it has been known since people sequenced tumor tissue, so for at least 10 years. Um, and you, the first findings were more when you resect a tumor and then sequence it. And then you have you know, it coming back and you resect it again and sequence it again. Then suddenly it looked different. That, that is one way of finding it. Um, another way of finding it is if you sequence the initial tumor and you have quantitative you know, mutational frequencies that you can assess, which is much more complicated, but people did it even 10 years ago. Then what you see is, well, this tumor has that mutation, but it only has it at 70% frequency. And this mutation, it only has at, you know, 13% frequency, which means, you know, 30% of cells don't have the first mutation and 87% of cells don't have the second mutation. So that is kind of translates into heterogeneity because you know that some cells didn't have that second mutation who had the first one. So you can either find it out if you just sequence tumor tissue, which is what people did until now, until liquid biopsy. Um, that's how you found it out there. But of course, it's much less, it's, it's more tricky and less perfect. What about the, uh, you know, the epigenetics of the <clears throat> cells that comprise the tumor or the, <laughs> you know, or the microbiome of the tumor? I've heard that uh, both may be in play. <clears throat> I mean, it, I know it's a whole other set of craziness to look at, but is anyone yeah, looking at that? <laughs> That's like the, that's the challenge of biology. You always have infinite complexity, right? The deeper you drill the hole of knowledge, the more you see that you didn't know before. So epigenetics, I mean, this is a whole, basically we're talking about methylation mostly and methylation are methyl groups that are attached to Cs. Uh, so we have four nucleotides, uh, A, T, G, and C, and the C can be methylated, which means you attach a certain chemical group and you can attach it or deattach it. There's a certain enzyme that does that. And so this mechanic um, is a mechanic that very likely is mostly used to switch genes on and off. So you have something called methylation islands before genes, uh, before a gene starts on the DNA. And that methylation island is a bunch of Cs that are methylated or not methylated. And that's an on-off switch. And what we see in cancer is that many cancer cells have these switches switched on or off in ways that is not your usual thing, um, pattern. And you can investigate this also through sequencing. It's a little more complicated and like loses you a lot of templates. So that's why, you know, there's a debate if it's good for early detection or not. And Quanchin currently doesn't do it because we are focused on precision sequencing to go single molecule deep. And methylation definitely destroys this capability because of the chemistry used to actually identify these methyl groups that destroys you a lot of DNA. Uh, but it can still work for early detection for other reasons. So, so that's just something, you know, it, it's useful as a tumor marker to have these methyl groups and the understanding of the patterns of methylation islands um, because it gives you kind of a snapshot of, you know, how your cell is currently being run. 
like what proteins get translated. Right. Yeah. How how um, sensitive do you think uh, your early detection liquid biopsy can be? You know, do you think you'll be able to find evidence of cancer before it's even visible? You know, maybe the million cell level. Yes. So we we have clinical trials going on right now, and like to give you a rough idea, at like a ninety five plus specificity, you find early stage cancers. It depends a little bit on the tumor type and so on. Like currently, we are talking about fifty to seventy five percent detection uh, precision sensitivity. Um, and this is going higher pretty fast. Uh, it's a function of how many samples we run. So that's also very new to diagnostics. This is like not a diagnostics technology. It's a vastly more complex AI technology that we use here uh, because it's basically a continuously improving and learning pattern recognition system. So the more samples you run through the system, uh, the, the exponentially more powerful it becomes in detecting new variants. Uh, of tumor mutation, tumor mutational patterns, which means cancer. And so based on the curves and trajectories we see in the improvement steps as a function of the number of samples we run through the system, uh, we believe we are getting far above 90% detection accuracy um, if you would hit 100,000 samples or something. Are you working on, uh, as if there's not enough to work on, are you, are you working <laughs> on other diseases too and looking at uh, them in a new unique way? Yes. So based on the business model we developed and that we bring a turnkey solution to customers and patients who want to do early detection of cancer, you know, one thing led to the next. So in order to have accurate detection systems, it's kind of very fascinating because most people think or have that kind of uh, outdated notion that there is something and then you see it or not. What we are dealing with is a way more complicated thing. It's all a probabilistic model, right? So what we, for example, saw is that germline genetic testing gives us invaluable insights into the risk uh, predisposition of a patient. So how likely is it that you have cancer at any given moment without liquid biopsy knowledge? That knowledge is absolute key to interpret liquid biopsy statistically. It's about positive predictive values, right? You, you need to understand, okay, given what we found and the pattern we found in you, we need to have additional probabilities for you in order to arrive at a more accurate prediction if you actually have cancer or not. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but once you do the Bayesian thing, it becomes super apparent why this is so important. And so we started adding additional dimensions to the system outside cell-free DNA, starting with germline genetics, then going further into your current prescription drug regime and into your medical history and your family history. And now we have a comprehensive system that basically takes in all that information and does a germline test, clinical grade genetic testing, that is added to your data set. And in totality, with the liquid biopsy, this system becomes really accurate. And why would, uh, why would germline testing, it seems like for men it would be a lot easier, I guess, because they produce so many sperm, but why would that be easier in the haploid state? Is it easier to characterize and sequence someone's DNA? No, it's a purely statistical thing. So if you do germline testing, you get a much more accurate determination about the probability that you have a certain type of cancer at any point in time, right? So it, it helps us to stratify the population um, into much more accurate buckets for cancer risk predispositions. That's very but when, important. But, but when you say germline, like, first of all, why? And second of all, is this, are you literally testing sperm in men, let's say? And in women, what would you test? You know? This just means we are testing your normal, your regular DNA, as opposed to, uh, it's basically hereditary testing. Just what is your normal, regular DNA, as opposed to your somatic variants. Like, you, you know, the stuff we are looking for in the blood are variants that are not your variants, that are the tumor variants. But if you add your own DNA to it, um, that gives us a very deep comprehensive profile. Now, this, the science of, you know, hereditary genetics is now much, much more advanced than people think and much more advanced than most of these tests actually are. So we build a whole backend system to connect your hereditary testing results to a vastly deeper system of, you know, medical research and databases than you normally get with 23andMe or something. And that allows us to build very specific um, risk predisposition profiles for the patients. So we know exactly that your risk of, I don't know, prostate cancer or lung cancer or whatever is like 
you know, 3.8 times higher than the regular population. And your risk of stomach cancer might be, you know, 50% lower or something. And these risks, uh, you know, your default risks, disease risks, are very important to calculate the probability that you currently have cancer based off your liquid biopsy. Because the liquid biopsy just, you know, statistically speaking, the liquid biopsy just tells us if we ran our tests on 50 pancreatic cancer patients and 50 non-diagnosed patients, so controls, and then you match more the pancreatic cancer patients, that still makes it, keeps it extremely unlikely that you have it because the incidence rate for pancreatic cancer is so low. But if you know you have an elevated risk, it changes the equation significantly. So that is why, you know, that's the fascinating thing about medicine. That's why it's so complicated. You have all these different layers of probabilities that you have to add up and you have to make sure you're actually right about these disease. So I guess you're saying you're, you're looking for small predispositions or biases and then stacking them to form a, a more accurate profile of what someone may have or be moving towards. Exactly. If you, um, if you sample, I don't know, you know, a whole bunch of cells, same cell type, you know, like let's say from, uh, you know, from my blood, how much variation will you see on the genetic level? Will you see much of any? Or is it all confined to the epigenetic level? I mean, the interesting thing is if we do cell-free DNA analysis, right? So we, we look at variants on your cell-free DNA, which is the DNA that is from dead cells that killed, it, killed themselves or got killed by the immune system. Um, we see significant numbers of mutations like variants um, because the cells that actually get killed and end up cell-free in the blood tend to be cells that had problems could be pre-tumor cells. It could be just inflammatory cells that got killed. Uh, so they have much more DNA damage. Um, so the bottom line is your var- the variations in your genome is, is very limited in healthy cells. It shouldn't be even there. Um, but if you look at the cells in your body that die or in critical condition, what you see is they have a ton of mutations that are different from your healthy DNA. And the more we do this, the more we see the details of these patterns and we see super interesting things. For example, pancreatitis patients have similar patterns to pancreatic cancer patients. And, you know, you know that chronic pancreatitis is kind of a predictor or or just leads to like significantly elevated pancreatic cancer risk. And so there seems to be a much more seamless evolution between inflammation and cancer. Hmm. So, okay. So you're looking at like the cellular detritus of someone, and if that shows a pattern, that lets you know, okay, when this person tends to have cells that are killed off by the immune system, they seem to be going in a certain direction more often than not. So that's telling you, like, I guess at some point, that may become cancer, and the immune system can't clear it, and it'll progress. Exactly. So, I mean, one of the great challenges that the liquid biopsy and early detection has that in healthy patients or in patients that are not diagnosed with cancer, you see a lot of cancer mutations. And that's, of course, very interesting. And you also see that the number or the frequency of cancer mutations goes up in older people. Um, And so, you know, cancer patients basically just show significantly elevated levels of cancer mutations. Um, But it's not that non-diagnosed patients don't have cancer mutations. So that leads to the question, do they have cancer? Like no one knows. Like, is that all, you know, what, what does it mean? In my opinion, it means you probably have cancer or some precursor of a tumor. And the older you get, the more tumors you have. And then it's a question, at what point do tumors become cancer? Like in, you know, when do they start developing uh, angiogenesis, like capabilities and build blood vessels and all kinds of things? Um, when do they become metastatic? So a cancer goes through all these evolutionary phases that makes it dangerous. And if it gets stuck in one phase, it's not dangerous. Um, and this very early stages of tumors, you know, I believe more and more, the more I see the results that we probably all have tumors at some age and then develop more and more tumors. And that's just a statistical question when one of them gets out of control. So, I mean, a lot of people seem to say that, oh, okay, you know, I guess it's a simplistic view. Cancer starts with one cell, but it, from what you're saying, it doesn't seem to be that way. It seems that cancer is a, um, I don't know, like a persistent environmental shift whereby cells over and over and over are created in such a way that they, they have these, you know, deformations or these problems, yet the immune system at some point is unable to 
you know, contain them and then it turns into a cancer? Yes, I think it's pretty straightforward what it is. It's uh, when you look at a highly developed metastatic tumor, um, you basically are dealing with a new organism in your body that has acquired, you know, very complex, very sophisticated skills. It has acquired the, the ability to reproduce fast, but not so fast that it kills itself. It has developed the ability to lay new blood vessels and, and get the nutrients it needs. It has developed the ability to fend off the immune system or fake it or like disguise themselves. It has developed the ability to um, interact with the surrounding tissue in a way that doesn't make the immune system too suspicious. And it has, to, it has developed the um, ability to separate cells from itself, send them into the bloodstream and have these cells go into other organs and then reproduce this entire system. That's completely non-trivial, right? This is a highly sophisticated, complex system. The question is, how do you get there? And the answer is evolution. It's not a smart thing. It's something that happens over time through billions and billions of trials and errors. And so you can reverse engineer the evolution of that tumor. It started with one specific ability, probably the ability to uncontrollably re reproduce. And then nearly all of these cells of these first cells died, of course, and failed. They could not, you know, replicate in a way that hit them from the immune system. They could not lay these blood vessels. They could not interact with the surrounding tissue effectively. But at some point, for some reason, our body allowed that system to try and try again billions and billions of times without knocking it out which allowed one cell at some point to figure out, okay, now I figure out how to interact with the surrounding tissue. And then they tried again billions of times. And then one of them figured out, okay, now I figured out how to lay these blood vessels. So a tumor is a product of billions or trillions of times of attempts to do something through random mutations. And, you know, it's the result of a, of a tremendous balancing and trial and error act over a very long period of time, like many, many years. Um, and the one thing that all tumors share is they somehow made it through their crazy evolutionary process without getting killed. And well, this, this also tells you, though, that to be successful, cancer needs a certain minimum set of, of things, you know. So you could say, OK, maybe it needs a minimum number of cells in a localized area. Um, it needs to have certain abilities. It needs to have certain amount of resources maybe it needs to have a certain um micro you know local localized microbiome that now supports its metabolism i mean i'm just imagining like what is the um i guess the essential toolkit that's needed for a cancer to be again i'm going to call it successful but you know to set out on its own now and you know orchestrate its own resources and communication and everything yeah and there's it sounds like a basic toolkit it needs but when you drill it down, every cancer is different because you have millions or billions of ways to get this done. I mean, you can, you know, re uh, uncontrollable replication can use the KRAS pathway or like, or can use the a KRAS mutation, but it can also use a PIK3CA or BREF mutation. So there are many ways of getting this done. Uh, tumor suppressor gene, you know, you have to, you have to terminate your, the genes in the cell that watch over the cell to prevent a tumor from happening. That gene needs to be destroyed. There are millions, there, there are thousands of ways to destroy it. So I think that is important that every cancer on an abstract first principle level, it just means that your body allowed a very evil thing to happen over many, many years, billions of times, because that is the level, the number of attempts it requires to develop that tumor. And so that's kind of the equation here. The more, the higher your mutational activities in your body, you know, on one side, and the lower your immune effectiveness is on the other side, the more you are creating a breeding ground for cancer. And that means if you eat plutonium or something or inhale it, then you have, you know, millions of times elevated mutational activity because you have radioactive substance in your body um, at a level that creates vastly more mutations. So you give them a much better breeding ground. And if you then have immune suppressants or something, then you knock out your immune system, then you have maximum cancer probability. Yeah, very interesting. Hmm. Sheesh. The subject is so rich. It's very, very interesting, you know? Yeah, it's super. I mean, it's also the more you dig into this, the more it becomes a giant statistics model, right? It's all probabilistic stuff. And 
an evolutionary model where you have driving forces and inhibiting forces. The only problem is we don't understand, especially the inhibiting forces, the immune system. We just have a very, very small understanding of the universe of the immune system, how it actually works and why is it so effective for some people and why is it bad for other people? What role does stress play in the whole thing and cortisol to suppress your immune system over long periods of time and, and so on? Well, even, you know, I'm just about at the end of questions, but um, even though you said all cancers are different and there are many different ways in which you can accomplish it's, you know, it's, it's objective. Um, I would think that if you categorize them in the right way, they, they all have certain hallmarks of things that they need to do, even though there could be 50 ways to do it, that, yeah. that all cancers share. Has that been identified and quantified? Yes, I can tell you what that is. It's number one, you need to knock out a cell's ability to control its replication. So that is the replicative pathway. So the cell has to follow that command to replicate, even though it should be stopped. Um, number two, the tumor suppressor mechanics need to be destroyed. So there are certain genes, multiple genes, uh, TP53 and so on, that watch over a cell to determine if it turns into an uncontrolled cell. And if that happens, the TP3 protein initiates apoptosis, so it kills the cell. So cancer has to destroy these mechanisms. There are, of course, thousands of ways to do that, but the mechanism has to be. Um, then the blood vessel thing, it needs to, as an organism that goes beyond the cell, the tumor as an organism has to turn into its own organism that lays these blood vessels in a strategic way so it can feed itself, uh, which is very sophisticated. Uh, so it has to kind of start thinking as some kind of mutated organ. Um, then the immune system, it has to do something to hide from the immune system because if you just do mutated things with your cell, you start expressing mutated proteins on the surface um, that make the immune system very suspicious and starts killing these cells. So it needs to have a mechanism to prevent that from happening, to prevent the expression of weird proteom proteomic profiles or patterns on the surface, or like mutated proteins. Um, I would say these are the four things that are kind of key hallmarks because they are on a first principle level, necessary. If you don't have that, it doesn't work. And then maybe a fifth one is metastatic capabilities. So can you send a single cell into the bloodstream and does this cell carry this entire knowledge of this twisted tumor organism to go and invade another tissue and replicate the entire tumor? Okay. Yeah. And then even out of these four factors, or maybe the fifth one of metastasis, uh, there's an order to them. So I wonder if you could distill it down to what's first and what's second, and then what comes after that as it, as it, you know, once it initiates and as it grows? Yeah, I think pretty much this is the order. You have to first start with the replication. Otherwise, you don't have the mutational power. Um, you can throw in a sixth one and say you need a certain instability, right? Because you, have the you need the maximum level of instability, genomic instability, um, without killing everything constantly. Because instability allows the tumor to mutate faster. And mutations are the key to figuring all these evolutionary things out. So you need the replication. You need to knock out the tumor suppressor gene. That is the first important step to, to create an evolutionary model. Um, and from there, you go into the other things, right? Then okay. once you scale that thing up, it needs to have the blood vessels. And once you scale it up, it needs to develop metastatic capabilities. No, Joe, this is great. I mean, like, you know, you're able to really characterize cancer, I think, in a, in a deeper and more understandable way than most people. That's why I ask. I, I appreciate all this. Um, you know, out of respect for your time, we're, we're right about the end. What's the best way for people to find out more about Quant Gene and to look into these uh, programs where they can, you know, get a, a hand on uh, if they have cancer, if they're headed towards it, et cetera? How can they find out more? So, uh, quantgene.com, that is always a good place to start. Uh, the product is actually available at Choose Serenity. Uh, dot com. We call it Serenity because it's a peace of mind solution. So you have control over your health and, and cancer. Um, and people are always like free to, uh, your listeners are more than welcome to also write me directly at jb at quantine. Okay, very good. Yeah, I just went to choose serenity.com. Okay, great. I'm looking at it right now. I'll include this in the show notes. So Joe, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate you coming back. Yeah, it's a, always a pleasure, Richard. Thanks a lot for running the show. And it's an amazing show. Thanks a lot. When you solve cancer, I want you to come back again so we can talk about that too. So hope <laughs> happy to do that. I hopefully soon. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.